There we go. So again, good afternoon to everyone, and thank you all for joining a little bit early. Uh, it's three o'clock on the dot, so we'll go ahead and start with today's uh, webinar. My name is William Moore with OJ JDP's Intech, and I want to welcome you all to joining today's uh, webinar that we have in conjunction with our colleagues with the Zero Abuse Project, titled For "Forensic Interviews and the Research for Prosecutors Need to Know." Before we get started, I want to go over a few items to keep in mind during today's web event. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. Past webinars and web events are archived on OJJDP's multimedia page and on OJJDP's YouTube channel. If you would like to retrieve any supporting materials related to any web events that are recorded, please reach out to the OJJDP TTA Help Desk. If you're having trouble downloading the items, please note that my colleague has placed a Google Drive link in the chat. Simply click on that link and you will get access to the materials related to today's webinar. If you're having trouble accessing that link, please feel free to reach out to the OJJDP TTA Help Desk and we will make sure that you get access to the resources related to today's webinar. All, atten all attendees have come in on mute so please note that you are on mute. Uh, please make sure that you utilize the dial out option in WebEx in order to hear the best audio for today's webinar. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please be sure to reach out to me or my colleague or co-host with Intech, and we'll be more than happy to help you with any technical difficulties that you have. Please note that we will utilize the chat box in order for you to provide any feedback or ask any questions. We ask for folks to simply go to the chat box, type in your question, but before you hit send, go to the to field and make sure you select all panelists. We will monitor all questions that are coming in during today's web event and address them accordingly. Help us count. If you're viewing by yourself, there's no need to type anything at this time. However, if you're viewing with another individual in the room with you, please go to the chat window, select all panelists, and type in the number of additional people that are in the room with you today. Again, if you're viewing by yourself, there's no need to type anything at this time. When you type your number, please be sure to, when you type your number, please be sure to also include the, um, not include yourself, sorry. <laughs> Please note that individuals will receive a certificate of attendance at the end of today's web event. You will receive your certificate within 24 hours. Here's a quick rundown of the agenda for today's webinar. And now I will turn it over to Rachel Johnson for today's web event. And Rachel, you have control of today's presentation. And whenever you're ready, you can begin. Fabulous. Thank you so much, William. Hello, everyone. My name is Rachel Johnson. I am the lead forensic interview specialist with an organization called Zero Abuse Project. I'm first going to just tell you a little bit about what Zero Abuse Project is, what we do, what my role is with Zero Abuse Project. Um, but again, I do just want to thank you all so much um, for joining us today. Uh, as you'll find as we're going through this presentation, I am a huge research nerd, so I love talking um, about all of the different research that's really pertinent to our practice as forensic interviewers, and also the ways that we can integrate research into um, our strategies with regards to prosecution of child abuse cases into our peer review and considerations for improving practice within our forensic interview. And so that we also make sure too that when we think about our multidisciplinary team process and our forensic interview process that we're continually assessing new research within our field and making sure that our practice is in alignment um, with new findings and with new best practice recommendations. So 
As I said, um, I'm the lead forensic interview specialist with Zero Abuse Project. Zero Abuse Project is a national organization that seeks to train uh, child abuse professionals and community members that are responding to child abuse to make sure to help support investigations, forensic interviews, and prosecutions that are in alignment with research best practices within the field. Um, a huge part of my job is not only doing training, developing content, um, but also technical assistance for forensic interviewers as well and so I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end but something that you should know is that one of my favorite parts of my job with Zero Abuse Projects is getting to help you all problem solve, talking through challenges that come up in interviews, strategizing for forensic interviews before you're ever in the chair in that room um, and so I love kind of getting to be an auxiliary member of your multidisciplinary teams um, through uh, again technical assistance and through training and multidisciplinary team development and all of those pieces as well too. Something you should know about me when I'm not doing training and technical assistance, I'm still a forensic interviewer in the field. So I have the privilege of getting to work with a few different child advocacy centers and multidisciplinary teams across the state of Minnesota. So still conducting forensic interviews in the field as well. Um, and I should also mention I'm based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So we are going to be talking today about uh, research and forensic interviews and talking about a few particular studies that I think are important to bear in mind and can shape and form, again, our considerations with regards to um, different themes or different issues that could come up as we are moving through our case trajectory. And also for forensic interviewers that are in the room, also considering um, some elements of our practice that we have some new research on and that we're starting to um, examine a little bit more. So this could be helpful for peer review and other functions such as that. Um, as we move through, I, um, I know folks are on mute, uh, but I do really welcome any questions that you have um, as we're moving through the presentation. If there's something that you want to dig into a little bit more deeply, something you want some additional citation or different additional, excuse me, recommendations for some other articles um, or other uh, supplemental materials, please don't hesitate to jump into the chat uh, and let me know. If it's not something that I can answer as I'm going through the presentation today, with any of you, I'm happy to set up a call um, or exchange emails with you to make sure that we get you the resources uh, that you need and that would be helpful for you all. On this next slide here, um, oops, there we go. Here we go, this is uh, my email address, so rachel at zeroabuseproject.org. So again, I'll talk about this at the end of the presentation, uh, but if you need to get a hold of me, have other technical assistance questions, need other resources, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, in addition, we also have a number of staff attorneys and we have a prosecution specific branch within our organization as well, um, as well as some investigations uh, specific folks as well too. So if you don't have a forensic interview specific question, I can always connect you with someone else that can answer your question too. So we're going to talk about some recent research studies, some updates within our field. We're first going to talk about an article that I really like um, that looks at disclosure processes for both sexual abuse cases as well as physical abuse cases. Um, the framing of this particular study is really interesting for me because a lot of times within our field we talk about those barriers to disclosure and what the researchers wanted to look at within this study um, is a little bit more into what are the facilitators of disclosure, right? So we know a lot about what inhibits a person's ability to make a disclosure, but what actually empowered or contributed um, a young person into um, feeling empowered to be able to move forward and make a disclosure. We're going to talk a little bit about question formation and question type, specifically looking at faux invitations and pairing uh, questions within our interview, um, particularly the practice of recasting questions, and I promise I'm going to get into what all of this means and define all of these terms in the context of the research studies that we're going to talk about. Um, talk a little bit too about some of the myths and stereotypes about um, children with disabilities and how developmental level and differing 
abilities and disabilities affect our scaffolding within our interview process. So not just the amount, the quality and quantity of details that we may obtain, um, but again, how well our children with developmental disabilities um, or differing cognitive abilities, how able are they to participate within our process and the way that we structurally approach our forensic interview. And then we're gonna talk a little bit um, about poly victimization, uh, poly victimization research and our forensic interviews. So I'm getting some feedback on my um, audio. Yeah. Your audio sounds good. Okay. I'm hearing an echo of myself. <laughs> So I don't know if someone's off mute or something like that. So let's see. If you want, Rachel, um, try switching over your audio to your phone and let's see if that helps at all. Okay, awesome, thank you. Oh, I think it, it seems like it has gone away. So let's just stick with this for now and then if it comes back, I'll switch over to the phone. So. Thank you all for your patience. I apologize for that. Um, so again, we're gonna talk a bit about poly victimization research in our forensic interviews and then some of our suggestions for practice. Um, on a macro level, I do just want to familiarize you all with a few research articles that have been around for a little while, but I feel, still think are really, really helpful um, for some of our foundational components as forensic interviewers in explaining what we do and why we do what we do. And also, I think um, for forensic interviewers on the call are also really helpful articles if you maybe are working with a prosecutor or with a jurisdiction um, where they're less familiar with the forensic interview or multidisciplinary team process or maybe want some education on the fundamentals of forensic interviewing and the research that supports forensic interviewing. So I just want to talk through some of those articles first before we get into some of this, these new and emerging sorts of topics and research. Um, the first of that is the OJJDP white paper on forensic interviewing. It came out in 2015. It was created by a coalition of representatives from all of the nationally recognized protocols, um, and it really serves as a consensus within our field of forensic interviewing of what is the research that supports the basis for the nationally recognized protocols and the nationally recognized state-based models for forensic interviewing. It's a really helpful tool in quashing a really common defense strategy that existed previously that focused on pitting the different forensic interview protocols against each other. So asking forensic interviewers, you conducted this interview in child first. Why didn't you use Tom Lyons 10 step or why didn't you use NICHD? So really the purpose of um, all of those representatives from the different protocol protocols getting together was to really establish these are the techniques that are nationally recognized within forensic interviews. This is the research that supports um, the use of those techniques. It really positions forensic interview protocols as being well, I should say an analogy I like to use for this is thinking about a forensic interview protocol as being kind of like a roadmap or as an atlas where there are multiple ways to get from point A to point B, but as long as you're staying on the roads, right, whether it's a dirt road, whether it's a highway, um, whether it's city streets, as long as you're staying on the roads, being in alignment with best practices, being in alignment with um, those non-leading, non-suggestive techniques, different, there are different ways from getting to point A to point B. Right. And so that document is really, really helpful for establishing those agreed upon best practices and strategies and tools and techniques that are utilized within the interview. So I really suggest that. Obviously, the American Professional Society on um, the Abuse of Children, APSAC, their forensic interviewing best practices guidelines also, um, again, talks about all of the research that supports the practice of forensic interviewing. It gives a historical perspective and it talks about, again, how there may be differences in the ways that different tools are utilized within the forensic interview process, but how those are research supported and if they're, you're utilizing those different techniques in alignment with what is stipulated by that forensic interview protocol um, and including a, a purposeful use of those within the context of the protocol training um, that those are supported in research, right? 
the last um, the last document that I also recommend it actually comes from zero abuse project and it is a position paper on the use of dolls and diagrams within the forensic interview process and I'm more than happy to also include um, at the end of this presentation links to these different documents in case you need them um, not all protocols utilize dolls and diagrams and that's okay again it's a roadmap we have different ways of getting from point A to point B within our forensic interview process but if you do use dolls and diagrams, I think that the Zero Abuse Project position paper on dolls and diagrams kind of say, serves a similar purpose, excuse me, to that OJJDP white paper, um, where it synthesizes all of the pertinent research. It talks about some of the defense strategies that may exist around the use of dolls and diagrams, um, and really gives some concrete um, examples on the appropriate purposeful use of these tools within the interview process and the research that supports the use of dolls and diagrams within the interview process. So again, we're going to focus primarily on newer research today and a few other sorts of strategies and techniques that we want to think about. But I do think it's always important to just talk about um, those as being really seminal works within our field. Um, they're pretty relevant um, in terms of when they have come out, whereas, you know, we have other research on the trajectory of our field for forensic interviewing, um, but these are regularly updated. They're pretty recent. And so I really, really recommend, again, if you're looking for kind of um, a macro um, a macro sort of review of what is forensic interviewing, what are the techniques that are employed within a forensic interview, and that research basis for defending an interview, um, I really, really recommend those three pieces of research. So now let's jump into some of our more recent uh, research. Like I had said, this is an article um, by Catherine McGuire and Kamala London that came out in 2019. Like I said, the focus of this article was really to look at not only what barriers are to disclosure, so what prevents a disclosure from being made, but also to think about what facilitates or what may contribute to empowering um, a young person to feel comfortable making a disclosure. So something that I think is a really important takeaway of this particular article is I think, especially within our field of forensic interviewing, we think a lot about um, historically, um, we think a lot, excuse me, historically about um, the dynamics of child sexual abuse and what contributes to how, when, and why children disclose sexual abuse. And I think a lot of times when people think about the use of the forensic interview, the primary use within multidisciplinary teams is still sexual abuse allegations. I'm gonna talk about poly victimization a little bit later on, but I'm kind of planting some seeds here, right, around poly victimization within the forensic interview. Um, and I say that because we need to acknowledge and recognize that while there are, again, um, beliefs, myths, stereotypes, thought processes around the dynamics of sexual abuse that maybe contribute to a barrier to disclosure or confusion on the part of the victim about experiencing sexual abuse or um, that maybe discourage a child from making a disclosure of sexual abuse. We also want to think about the ways that there can also be, whether it's on an individual basis, a motivational block, or um, cultural, larger kind of societal myths and stereotypes that are um, protective at times of physical abuse or neglect or other sorts of experiences of abuse and maltreatment. Um, excuse me, other experiences of abuse and maltreatment that children may have in addition to sexual abuse. So we think about all of these sorts of societal perspectives, myths, all of that in terms of sexual abuse. And I think we need to get a little bit better about thinking about how those myths, perspectives, those dynamics also exist with physical abuse um, or also exist with other forms of maltreatment, right? Because when we think about physical abuse, I think sometimes we ignore the ways that um, you know, for a lot of children, when they encounter or they experience physical abuse, they oftentimes are thinking about it as a response to um, perhaps something that they have done wrong or to being in trouble or something um, where they feel responsible for it, right? There can be that internalization that it's the child's fault, that it's not problematic, that it's not a form of abuse and maltreatment because it's in response to that child's perspective um, that they 
they have done something wrong, right? And so we want to think and realize that even in physical abuse cases, there's those sorts of perceptions that sometimes can impact um, a victim of child physical abuse's ability to respond, right? So a lot of times barriers to disclosure are overlooked. Um, and a lot of times we see pretty significant delayed disclosure of physical abuse into adulthood, right? And so this wanted to look at what were some of the factors that impacted whether or not children disclosed physical abuse. So a couple interesting things about this study, just breaking down a bit about that methodology. So they looked at 377 males and 530 females. Um, one of the things is they ended up throwing out the data with regard to the male victims of child sexual abuse because that sample size wasn't uh, big enough, which I think is interesting because, again, when we think about statistics, when we think about self-reporting, we know that a lot of times the abuse of male masculine victims is oftentimes underreported because again those myths and stereotypes um, or some of those social ramifications that victims can experience if they come forward and talk about their experience of abuse and maltreatment um, so again they ended up throwing out the data about the male child sexual abuse victims um, but they kept the female sexual abuse victims data um, and then also asked about the experiences of physical abuse as well so they found that about a third, so about 32% reported um, abuse in childhood and about half um, had made some sort of lifetime disclosure. Another interesting, excuse me, interesting thing about the study as well too is that they did find um, that the disclosure rates were actually a bit higher um, within this particular study than what they've seen in other uh, rates of disclosure studies. Some of the common reasons for disclosure for both child sexual abuse and child physical abuse was feeling like they had a close friend to tell. So someone that they felt comfortable and that they felt safe with making a disclosure of child sexual abuse or child physical abuse to. Um, again, akin to what I was talking about earlier, the most common reason for non-disclosure was not realizing it was abuse at the time. Um, and again, this is where I think it's interesting because we talk a lot about those dynamics of sexual abuse that can contribute to that child not recognizing or realizing that abuse is occurring or that can contribute to that child's own internalization or own perspective of um, fault or blame within their sexual abuse. And we see sort of similar dynamics with the physical abuse on the other side, which again is why I think that we need to really think about those perspectives within our interview about the messages that the child has received around uh, both the physical abuse as well as the sexual abuse about their understanding what they think and feel about that because those messages exist around the physical abuse as well that sometimes can protect the physical abuse or prevent a child from recognizing that something not okay is happening with the physical abuse or may cause them to um, internalize or engage in self-blame um, around that physical abuse. Like I had said, they found that the disclosure rates in this study were slightly higher um, than some of the other studies. They found that another large facilitator to disclosure within these particular cases, and again, like I said, I'm planting more seeds um, as we had talked about uh, earlier um, uh, with regard to poly victimization, but um, they found that in most of these cases that both the childhood victims of sexual abuse as well as physical abuse flew under the radar of authorities. So they found that um, children were, you know, similarly to what we know about disclosure rates and rates of disclosure, but, um, you know, many children never were, were identified by the authorities or by an investigative party as being a victim of abuse. Um, a lot of the disclosures were accidental disclosures to either other peers um, or family members members and weren't necessarily identified by authorities or by an investigative party. However, one of the things that they found um, with the physical abuse dynamic specifically is that children who presented to the authorities, so prevent, presented, excuse me, to investigators for another reason, such as for sexual abuse or for neglect or for another sort of concern, that children who presented for a reason other than physical abuse and then were asked about physical abuse over the course of that forensic interview or the course of that cursory interview or minimal facts interview um, were far more likely to make a disclosure of physical abuse. 
So I think that this is really significant um, within our field particularly um, because, again, we oftentimes forget about that polyvictimization lens within our forensic interview. And like I said, I'm going to talk about polyvictimization and the role of polyvictimization um, a bit more later on. Um, but we see that a lot of times there are undisclosed forms of abuse because children don't necessarily see that segue or that platform um, to be able to discuss or to be able to tell or talk about that abuse and maltreatment and being given that opportunity to talk about it by a screening question within a forensic interview or an exploratory question in a forensic interview or in another type of interaction um, created that opportunity for that young person to be able to talk. Um, about their physical abuse or these other experiences of abuse and maltreatment um, that they had encountered or had endured. Um, I think a piece of this that is also uh, particularly interesting with regards to physical abuse is that there was far less likely disclosure overall of physical abuse than there was sexual abuse. And like I said, when we're just thinking about our cases and our case dynamics, I think we really need to um, examine why there can feel on the part of victims a lack of permission or a lack of um, ability to be able to disclose that physical abuse or why sometimes there can be a lack of understanding or nebulousness around um, whether or not physical abuse is occurring for a young person. Um, and again, prevention, education, body safety, education, all of that is um, certainly a separate advocacy-based um, function to what we do within the forensic interview or the course of our criminal investigations, but again, is kind of a, a sister or a complement, right, within our field. And when we think about that body safety education or prevention education, um, a lot of those messages are really focused on, again, that sexual abuse and that understanding of the nature of different types of touches that a child may receive on their body. And I just think about, um, for the purpose of physical abuse, about how sometimes those concrete messages aren't really given to children about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Um, and children really have a lot of disambiguating um, sometimes when physical abuse is actually occurring um, or disambiguating whether or not they are the cause or the source or to blame for that physical abuse. So I think just something to think about within the context of our field um, more broadly about what those myths and stereotypes and messages are with regards to the physical abuse um, and how that really impacts how victims see their experience of physical abuse and their willingness or unwillingness to make a disclosure. Um, similarly to what I was just talking about, there's another additional study, um, there's a citation here, Katz and Barnett's, um, that talks uh, about a very similar theme, um, that 57.3% of children first disclosed their physical abuse in the first time, for the first time when they came in for a forensic interview about another topic. So again, just speaking to that importance of screening for other forms of maltreatment and abuse when children are presenting for a particular reason, which is something, again, that we're going to talk about more when we discuss some of the poly victimization research and think really about um, how that research affects our, our interview process. But we do know that children, 66% of children, if they've experienced one form of maltreatment, they have experienced additional forms of maltreatment. And we also can identify within this too the ways that the experience of multiple forms of maltreatment can really shape, right? what those disclosures look like and sound like. So I'll just give you a bit of a concrete example here. Uh, I do a lot of work um, specifically looking at the intersection of LGBTQIA plus folks, queer and trans youth um, within our forensic interview and within our multidisciplinary team response to child abuse. And I think about how um, when children may present um, for different types of abuse and maltreatment, how the context of their family system, the context of environmental factors, the context of other life experiences that they're having can really affect what their disclosure looks like and sounds like. So here's an example of that. Um, we know that one of the huge risk factors for commercial sexual exploitation um, or for sex trafficking is homelessness um, or a lack of housing um, or a safe place to go for teens and adolescents. 
So when we look at some populations, like specifically within the LGBTQIA plus community, where we have teens and adolescents that either because of abuse and maltreatment um, or because of feeling alienated, not accepted, not supported from their family of origin or from their caregiver um, being subjected to, again, homelessness or a lack of housing stability or having a supportive place to stay, how that can become a contributing factor to potentially being vulnerable to commercial sexual exploitation or be vulnerable to trafficking. And so to understand how, when, and why the child may or may not talk about that commercial sexual exploitation or about, excuse me, that risk to um, sex trafficking, we also have to understand um, what is going on in the child's life that has contributed to some of their vulnerability, right? Um, why they don't feel safe at home. What experiences are they having there? Is there other abuse or maltreatment that's happening within their home um, where they don't feel safe? or don't feel comfortable being um, with their family of origin or with um, who is currently stipulated as their caregivers, right? So you can really see there's an enmeshment between all of these different life experiences, um, whether it has to do with that reason for being there um, in the interview process that day, um, that can really, really affect how, when, and why that child discloses how they view that disclosure, how they view the different forms of maltreatment that they're experiencing, and can really shape um, how they talk about these different experiences. So that's part of that holistic approach, is really understanding, again, those other forms of maltreatment that are going on within the child's life or these other sorts of experiences, historical experiences, or environmental factors that can contribute to the child's disclosure and how, when, and why they disclose. And we'll talk about that more coming up. We're now going to talk about a study, um, it's called Talking Past Each Other, Interviewer and Child's Verbal Exchanges Within the Forensic Interviews. Um, and I feel like one of the main takeaways within this particular study is, um, and you'll hear those of us that are forensic interviewers and do a lot of training on forensic interviews, you probably hear this a lot, um, but that importance in really thinking about the rapport phase of your forensic interview as being an investment for the rest um, of the interview process, right? So we really, really want to think about um, that that rapport, uh, rapport building, narrative event practice, episodic memory training as being an investment for the rest of our interview process. And what do I mean when I say that? I mean that one of the things that happens within forensic interviewers is interviews, excuse me, is that we don't necessarily always see forensic interviewers adjusting their language or their terminology or their approach to the interview based on what they are observing in the child that is in front of them. Um, a piece of this has to do with the actual concrete developmental and linguistics dynamics within the interview process, but it also can have to do as well with where the child is at in the process of disclosure and what indicators we're absorbing with regards to where that child is at within the process of disclosure. So a few things happen here. One is that sometimes interviewers start their interview and they encounter reluctance or they encounter hesitation on the part of the child. The interviewer goes into panic mode and starts getting really rapid fire with their questions. Um, it becomes kind of like an interrogation of the child. The interviewer is so nervous that I'm not gonna quote unquote get there, get to the disclosure, that they forget that the purpose of the interview is not to quote unquote get a disclosure. It's to create an environment that's comfortable for the child so that if there are things that they want to talk about or experiences that they've had, that an environment has been created, that there's an invitation for them to do so. When we're only thinking about getting the disclosure, one, we're missing the purpose of our forensic interview, but we're also missing a lot of opportunities to give that child the support or the reassurance or the tools or strategies that they need that could potentially bridge that gap and allow that child that environment that they need in order to feel comfortable to tell or talk about their experiences. So one of the ways I think about it is as forensic interviewers, 
Um, I think about the disclosure as being kind of like a door within the interview process or that opportunity to disclose is kind of like a door within our interview process. And us as forensic interviewers, we walk up to this door and we have this giant key ring. And on that key ring, we have all of the different ways that we ask questions. We have our interview aids, such as dolls and diagrams, utilizing our easel paper for drawing. Um, we have reframing of questions, right? We have numerous different ways that we may ask about touch or ask about bodily experience, right? Um, and it's our job to take those different keys, those different tools or structures that we have that give that opportunity for that child to talk about abuse and maltreatment. And we need to try out those different keys until we find one that gives that child that structure that they need in order to segue or give them that opportunity to talk about their experiences. There are certain times in our forensic interview process where that key is not going to be on their, on our key ring, right? Either we haven't found a way to connect with that child that creates that environment or the alternative hypothesis of the child just simply doesn't have something to disclose or there was a misunderstanding and what came in on the report is not reflective of the child's actual experience. In those cases, uh, we don't just kick down that door, right? Um, because that would be, uh, you know, really compromising the forensic integrity of that interaction, right? We just recognize we put our keys away, we walk away from the door. Um, and again, if there's another sort of precipitating event that uh, creates an opportunity for that child to come back, for a follow-up interview or we convert this interview to an expanded interview or we just decide um, you know based on the alternative hypothesis that there isn't something for the child to talk about we go to closure and we end the process entirely um, we still again maintain the forensically soundness of the entire interaction right so a lot of times for interviewers when they encounter that reluctance or they encounter that hesitation within the interview process like I said, they go into panic mode, right? The thing about this is we really need to normalize that reluctance is gonna be part of our interview process. One of the big rules that children are taught um, with regard to interacting with adults is not to interact with strangers. Um, we're asking them to talk to a stranger, going to a place they've never been before to talk about something that could be potentially very difficult for some children to talk about, right? But we're also asking them to interact with an adult in a way that's totally different from how they're used to interacting with adults in other contexts, right? Because how we listen to children in the interview room is different from how they interact with parents or at school or at daycare. So we know children already have a lot to overcome when they're coming coming in for a forensic interview and when they're getting used to this process, right? So we want to adjust to what we're observing in the way that they communicate, in the way that they're able to answer questions. And we don't wanna get nervous or hesitant when we have that reluctance. It's a normal part of the process. There's a reason why all of our nationally recognized protocols include a rapport phase. There's no you know, nationally recognized forensic interview protocols out there, state-based models out there that don't include a rapport phase. And that's because we really need to have that opportunity to understand how that child communicates so that we can adjust accordingly within our interview process. There is a place for all different types of questions within our interview process. You'll hear sometimes out in the field, oh, you should never ask a direct question. Um, you should never ask a yes or no question within the interview process. Um, and we really don't believe that. Um, sometimes we do need to ask a direct question, like a yes or no question, in order to avoid assumption about a child's meeting or starting a line of questioning based on a particular assumption, assumption right? So there is a place for that. It's really, though, about how we use our continuum of questions and how we integrate in a purposeful way the different types of questions um, and understand um, the different types of questions. Um, I'll use this example. I was one time in a, a training exercise on court testimony, um, and it was something that was put forth uh, by folks that worked in our jurisdiction locally. 
Um, and the defense attorney in this exercise had posed a question to me with the transcript of the forensic interview and essentially started working through each question in the forensic interview and asking me, what was your purpose with this question? What was your purpose with this question? What was your purpose with this question? Um, and as you can imagine, we ask a lot of questions within the forensic interview process. And so if a defense attorney chose to use that strategy to ask you about what the purpose is of each of your questions, you would probably have to, um, it would take a lot of time, right? You'd have a lot to testify to. However, the spirit of that exercise was really, really important. Because for us as forensic interviewers, we should be able to explain why we asked each question that we did. Because even when we're asking a child about what their age is or about what they like to do for fun in rapport, it still is purposeful. We're not just asking those things to ask about them. We're asking them because we are gathering the information that we need in order to be able to adjust our questioning and to think about how we need to approach this interview with this young person. So the hourglass approach is one example of that. So when we think about our hourglass approach, we're first thinking about using our open invitation question. So our more broad uh, narrative um, excuse me, our broad questions that allow for additional narrative or narrative responses, right? And then sometimes we have to ask a more direct question, like an option posing question or a yes, no question. But when we ask these more direct questions, we want to make sure that we open it back up like an hourglass after we ask those more direct questions so that we don't continue to get more narrow and more narrow. Um, sometimes that's referred to as funneling um, so that again, we get more assumptive with our questions. We want to avoid that. So I'll give you an example. We may ask a child to tell us all about their morning from when they got up this morning to coming here for the interview. That would be an open invitation. So that's a listening, a narrative response, right? Um, as the child's telling me about their morning, they may say something like, and we all went outside to play until we had to get the bus. So now I wanna clarify that. So I'm gonna ask a little bit more direct question. Who all went outside to play before you got on the bus? And the child will clarify, right? I asked a WH question there about who all was there. And then after that, I may ask, open it back up, tell me all about playing with cousin, with brother, with whomever else was there, right? So again, there is a place for asking those yes, no questions or those more direct questions, those WH questions within our interview process. But we do just wanna make sure then that we open it back up to elicit narrative after we get some of those clarifications within our interview process. The only question that um, we never want to include within our interview process is our suggestive questions, right? Because then we're going to elicit a suggestive response or there's more of a likelihood of eliciting a suggested response within those questions, which again, we want to avoid um, elements of suggestibility within our interview process or the potential of being um, leading within our interview process. Cued recall or cued response, I think is another area um, Cued recall or um, cued, which elicits, excuse me, a cued response, I think is also a really important type of question, particularly when we're thinking about the child's developmental level. Um, cued recall questions are when we integrate um, a bit of the narrative that the child has given us into our questions. So saying things like, you said something yucky happened with Uncle Al. Tell me all about yucky things happening. Um, and those questions tend to be more effective sometimes with younger children that need a little bit more of a concrete anchor or frame for what you are eliciting additional narrative about. So those cued recall questions can be really, really helpful. And this is where in rapport, we can experiment with the different types of questions that we may need to ask within the forensic interview to really look at what is this child's performance when we're asking these different types of questions within the interview process. Sometimes too, we also use what's called facilitators. So you can see some of those utterances here below under this second set of bullet points where sometimes without changing a topic area um, or moving to a different subject or a different element within the child's narrative, we cue them to let us know that we want more information by saying, mm-hmm, or then what happened next, or tell me more about that, right? So we can um, continue to ask for that additional facilitation. Yeah, a question had come in, 
how do you define a suggestive question? Um, and I think uh, for all intents and purposes, there's a number of different ways that questions could potentially be suggestive. Um, but I think that a suggestive question is maybe a question where we're just asking a child to um, confirm a statement or an assertion that we're making. So instead of asking, um, you know, what color was someone's shirt, um, saying something like, his shirt was red, wasn't it, when the child hasn't introduced that information. Um, so we're suggesting or we're leading a child to maybe a particular hypothesis or our own introduced information instead of asking the child to relay or deliver that information. We also need to really let the child know within our interview process that we want to know the full story, right? Um, our job is to listen to children, not to talk to children. And in situations where there was interview instructions that were made, um, again, different protocols have different pr approaches to interview instructions, um, but children were cued to know that it was an open interview, meaning that um, the interview wanted to know all about what had happened. It was emphasized that we listened to the child when those questions that really elicit that full narrative response were asked within the child. Um, children reported that they felt more listened to, they felt more heard um, within those open interviews. They also found too that um, children were more likely to provide additional details um, when they were told that we wanted to know all about what happened or everything that had happened. Um, something that I see commonly, particularly with newer interviewers is as adults, one of the ways that sometimes we assert politeness is we'll want to say, tell me a little bit about that or tell me a little about XYZ, something that the person likes to do. We don't want to know a little bit about it. We want to know all about it. And there's a few really important parts when we think about wanting to know all about what happened. One is particularly with young children, developmentally, um, they have, or part of their developmental level is this idea of theory of mind. So there's this perception on the part of young children that you know everything that they know, right? That all of the knowledge that they hold um, within their head, that you also have that knowledge as well too. So reminding children, I wasn't there when this happened, or I wanna know all about this is really, really important to cue to the child that you don't know everything that they know. And the other part of this too is that a lot of times at this point within the process, it's not necessarily clear to us what is going to be um, what is going to be relevant or irrelevant when it comes to corroborating or refuting the details of the forensic interview. So having that opportunity to gather 3.5 times more um, of the information um, or the peripheral sensory details, contextual details, um, can be really, really important because again, we don't necessarily know which of those details are going to be relevant um, for investigators when they take the information derived from the forensic interview and corroborate or refute that forensic interview. So I'll just give you a, a couple of examples of this. Um, we know that especially for children that are 10 and under, that detail of when something happened is very, very difficult um, for young children. They have a lot of difficulty um, telling us with precision when exactly something happened or when exactly something had occurred. So we can still gather details about when things happen, but we have to be a little bit creative about how we may cue a young person to tell us about when things happen. So some of the strategies we may use within the interview process are asking about other things that they did that day. Um, what happened after, if they mention that they go to school, what grade they were in, who their teacher was, if they tell us about the dwelling that they lived in, what did the house or the apartment look like, if mom was at work when it happened, what job did mom have, right? And those details then can yield information that could potentially corroborate or refute a particular timeline of abuse and maltreatment. I think about a couple of cases that I had um, one of which where a child was telling me about the first time um, that she had experienced abuse on the part of the alleged offender in this particular case, that the reason why she was left um, for him to babysit her uh, was because she had macaroni and cheese served with hot dogs in it and she refused to eat the hot dogs. So since she didn't eat her food, 
all of the other kids went with mom to the park and she was left with this person and that created this opportunity for him to allegedly offend on her the first time. So the way that they corroborated timeline when they were looking at this course of conduct or the timeline in which this occurred, they asked mom about this detail about a time that she was left in care of this person because she didn't eat her macaroni and cheese with hot dogs. And mom knew specifically what date that had occurred, right? Um, because it was around the start of school. So that when detail or that detail that came became important for corroborating timeline didn't come because I asked the child when did this happen or when did this occur, but by gathering all of the details about how it started, the precipitating events, that yielded detail that then supported investigators in corroborating um, or refuting that statement. Same thing I think about another kid I interviewed where through gathering sensory information, she told me that she heard and saw an ambulance go by her house the last time that she was sexually assaulted by her dad. Um, with this particular child, she lived in a very rural area. She lived on a dirt road. So they were able to actually look at the records of when an ambulance would have gone um, by her house. And they were able, in the time frame that she was describing, there was only one incident where that had occurred. So that was used to assist that timeline. Again, it didn't come from asking when, it came from asking about the sensory information, the peripheral details about what was happening, what she heard, what she saw, what she tasted, what she smelled when the abuse was occurring. So these additional details, these contextual details, this quality and quantity of details is really, really important. And we don't always know how it's going to be important yet and so assessing for that full story and getting all of the information about that is going to be really, really important and is part of why we include those conversational instructions. Another piece of this, just to um, add on an additional layer here, when we think about those open invitations or when we think about queuing questions, we want to be really careful about what we call faux invitations. Um, so faux invitations is when we basically take a WH question and we just tack a tell me about in front of the WH question, right? So we agree that those open invitation questions um, are one of the more preferred questions within the interview process because they're the most open-ended. They're going to be cueing that narrative, right? Um, but sometimes we accidentally use this technique or misuse those open invitation questions and ask a more closed-ended question, but kind of pretend that it's an open-ended question by just having that tell me about out in front of it. So um, one of uh, my uh, colleague, um, that one of my colleagues here with Zero Abuse Project works with, uh, uh, kind of talks about these full invitations as being a WH question in a trench coat, right? So for all intents and purposes, it works like a WH question and it's going to cue that narrative like a WH question, but again, it's disguised as being that open-ended tell me about question. And it's something that as interviewers, we need to really um, watch out for within our interview process. So um, some examples of this are tell me what happened, right? What happened is really a WH question um, with tell me tacked on the front or tell me what he looked like is a what he looked like question with a tell me tacked on the front. Again, like I said, there's a place for all of our different types of questions within our interview process, but depending on where you're at in your point within your interview process or the type of information that you're trying to elicit at this particular point, there are different types of questions that will yield more or less detail. So we want to be careful um, about when we use WH questions, we want to be using them because it is purposeful to do so at that point. And when we're at a place where we want to be um, assessing or, or inviting a full narrative that then we're using a true narrative invitation or open invitation at those points within, um, within the process as well. Oops. Recasting occurs um, in situations where we start asking a child a question and we either think of a different way to ask it um, in the middle of asking the initial question or we rephrase or reframe before we allow that child the opportunity to respond. So this is something else that can be really, really problematic within our interview process and this can really happen both in positive directions of so positive recasting as well as negative recasting. 
a couple of things about this. I think for folks that are newer interviewers, as we're still getting used to the type of language and the approach that we utilize in order to ask questions within our interview process, we oftentimes are in a situation where we start asking a question and then realize partway through, um, oh, there's a better way or a different way that I could ask that. And instead of just asking the initial question, pausing, and then telling the child or giving an instruction around, let me ask you about this in a different way or let me ask in a different way. Um, we just kind of bulldoze through and just ask a tag question, right? So two questions in one there. What we know from the work of Anne Grafham Walker and others is that when it comes to tag questions, especially young children, oftentimes will just isolate out a part of the question. Um, or will just answer the part of the question that they most identify with or are more likely to understand. And so sometimes we perceive that we have a complete answer to a question, but because we've recasted the question, um, we don't actually know if it is truly an answer to essentially both the questions that were included in the recasting, excuse me, or if the child has just isolated out a portion of the question. So um, here are some examples. Did you go to his car? What happened next, right? So again, this there may be a purposeful reason to clarify, did you go to his car? But ask that, get the answer from the child, and then use the answer to then decide, are you gonna continue facilitating um, in a narrative sequence, or are you going to ask for more detail or ask an open-ended question about the answer? Um, this too, sometimes we think about these option posing questions as being helpful, um, but you know, we could just ask, tell me about your clothes or where were your clothes when this happened? Instead of tell me about your clothes, were they on or off? We have a couple problems here too, because we also have an option posing question here without the opt out of or something else or something different. But again, here's where we wanna just ask, either tell me all about your clothes or were your clothes on, off or something different, right? Because again, we have now recasted this question midway through, which can impact the answer that we receive from the child. In some research, this is some research from Tom Lyon that looked at faux invitations and about um, how invitations were utilized within the interview process. And one of the things that they found um, over the course of examining different forensic interviews is that most invitations were true invitations. So this is helpful to know because it really does speak to um, the fact that interviewers are typically, most of the time, 76% of the time are utilizing invitations that are in alignment with what the research tells us um, about, uh, about utilizing these narrative sorts of questions, right? But they did find that when questions were recasted, they tended to be fall into a negative recasting. So they tended to fall into either a negative framing of the question or a more narrow framing of the question. So basically, you know, one of the things to think about within this is that if recasting is showing up a lot within our interview process, that we could be missing opportunities to really be asking for the, the totality the fullness of the entire narrative um, by prematurely narrowing our questions through recasting. So something that we want to be mindful of. And this is another area where I think um, examining this within our examining this within our peer review is, is going to be really, really important. And I also really stress here too that importance of in our interview process of pausing um, and taking a moment sometimes to think um, and to rephrase if we need to and giving a cue about rephrasing if we need to do that. So for me, sometimes if I maybe ask a question that I want to rephrase or ask about in a different way, I really, really try and again, ask that initial question, maybe the less preferred question, pause, give that opportunity to for that young person to respond um, and then rephrase. Sometimes, like I had said, I will use an interview instruction and just say, um, you know, let me ask about this in a different way um, and reapproach the subject. Again, use a different key on my key ring um, to approach the particular topic that I'm questioning about. We're gonna talk now a bit about narrative skill and testimonial accuracy in um, typically developmental, developing children and those with intellectual disabilities. So this research is important because a lot of times there are myths and stereotypes about 
um, children or people with disabilities, adults with disabilities, ability to participate um, within our forensic interview process. And again, this is really akin to what we've already discussed, which is that regardless of the child's age, regardless of their abilities and disabilities, investing in that rapport building process, that narrative event practice within rapport is going to be really, really important for getting a feel for how the child in front of us communicates. There's also a component of this too that's really tied to our pre-interview preparation as well too. So trying to spend the time delineating whose role on our team it is to gather any and all information possible from um, non-offending caregivers or other adults. Um, you know, sometimes it's an ongoing uh, social worker that's worked with the family or children's mental health, someone else that maybe has perspective on how the child communicates, what tools may be most effective or assistive devices or um, modifications to our interview process that may help support um, or be important tools for this young person while they are conducting their interview or participating within our interview process. So when we're thinking about narrative coherence, we're not necessarily thinking about level of detail within our interview process, but we're thinking about concretely the ability to um, to participate in narrative event practice, to participate in episodic memory training. Um, and we know that that can be affected both by the child's developmental level as well as their abilities and disabilities. So um, we see sometimes situations, not only with children with disabilities, but sometimes young children, sometimes highly traumatized children or children who have been the victim of multiple victimizations, um, really have difficulty with the scaffolding process within our interview. So um, they're kind of all over the place, right? We see a lot of scatteredness at times um, in some of the interviews that we conduct uh, with different people, right? So we know that young children can struggle to really be able to construct those coherent accounts or to be able to talk about one particular episode or something specifically. So sometimes this can be the result of their ability to engage in memory retrieval. Sometimes it can be difficulty um, overall with language and communication, um, how advanced or sophisticated their ability to, um, their language facilitation is based on their age or their abilities and disabilities, um, and lack of context or lack of social understanding as well. Um, again, we think about the other circumstances where young people engage with adults and they're not typically asked questions um, or asked to tell about their experiences in ways that are similar to how we ask about them within the interview process. So it can be very, very new. Um, again, another ploy for why that uh, investment in rapport building is really, really important. So. Um, what they found is that children with intellectual disabilities are less likely than their typically developing peers to be providing conversational scaffolding that would support the development of narrative skills. Um, so when we're thinking about this, we're thinking about a child's developmental age being compared to children um, of their chronological age, right? So what they did find within this, though, is that children with intellectual disabilities um, sort of performance when they were compared to children whose chronological age matched their developmental age, right? Again, why we move forward within our interview process based on developmental age, which may or may not be in alignment with chronological age um, within, within our interview process. Um, again, children may have difficulty constructing coherent accounts when recounting maltreatment. So we could see the ways that um, scaffolding or having this narrative coherence or being able to again focus on one particular episode and sequence through that particular episode can really pose a challenge um, in cases or in interviews with children with disabilities as well as with young children. Um, again, we know that children with disabilities oftentimes have um, greater risk factors in becoming victims of abuse and maltreatment. And I think sometimes we hear within our teams, whether it is said concretely or explicitly or not, um, I think sometimes there can be worries or concerns on the part of our teams of a child with a disability's ability to participate within the process, or there can be already an assumption made that these children are going to have more difficulty with the process or not be able to participate um, or, um, you know, will not be able to uh, follow the structure of how we ask about things within the interview process. 
Like I had said, um, when we think about um, children and how they present and what their performance is in the ways that they have presented, um, we found a lot of congruence, again, between children's developmental age and children that were of the chronological age similar to children's developmental age. So when we move through our interview process, we assess what that child's developmental age is through external information prior to the interview process and then invest meaningfully in narrative event practice in rapport, we have that ability to tailor our interview to that specific developmental level of the child. And when that happens, we see that um, there's not necessarily for children with disabilities um, less of an ability to give that uninterrupted narrative um, to be able to scaffold the interview process or, or frame different questions within the interview process um, in a way that children of a similar developmental age were able to do, right? Um, so another piece of this too is that there can be a tendency sometimes to want to be more uh, concrete or more direct in questions. Um, when we see we're interviewing a child with a disability, the assumption is made, oh, we have to be more direct with our questioning. We need to ask more of those narrow questions or more of those WH questions. And for some children, right, um, there are circumstances, as we've talked about, where there is a necessity for more direct questions or more closed-ended questions within an interview, but we don't want to assume that just because a child has a developmental disability that they're completely unable to answer any sort of open narrative prompts, right? We really, again, need to look at how the child's performance is as they present in front of us. We talked about this a little bit already, um, but again, um, we want to continue to follow our process, again, integrating what we've learned about the child and following that developmental age of the child as we have talked about. Um, they also found too that the negative perceptions of children with intellectual disabilities um, sometimes can, again, create assumptions about how credible a child statement is about um, how much detail they're able to give. And again, we really want to be responsive to that child that is in front of us. Um, I think about situations with my teams sometimes where we maybe have had um, a parent report to an advocate or someone on the team like, oh, my kid will never talk to you. My kid is really, really shy. They won't talk to you, right? Um, and sometimes those kids have been the most chatty um, within forensic interviews that I've conducted. And I think the opposite are true too. We sometimes hear a report from a parent or caregiver from a team member that, you know, this child's indicated that they are ready to talk about this or they want to talk about this and then they get into the interview room and they're not forthcoming at all, right? Um, and so we don't want to really let one single dynamic um, of uh, one single dynamic of a child's identity or a child's historical experience or one facet of a statement made by the child to um, overshadow everything that we can gather um, and everything that we can learn about the child through the interview process, especially from rapport. Um, a question had come in, what are your thoughts on the find advanced and adapted training for those who have disabilities um, and for those who don't speak? Do you find this method one that will be able to um, stand up in court? I do feel like we have as forensic interviewers a responsibility to think about, and as multidisciplinary teams, right, to recognize that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach and we oftentimes need to make modifications to our interview process, whether it's related to the timing and location of the interview, the physical space within the interview process, um, cultural considerations that, um, you know, we may need to put into consideration when we're thinking about our interview process, thinking about um, the different tools, techniques that we may use within our interview process. Different children will need different things um, from the process. And I think when we're considering what those different modifications are, we need to really think about what our articulated purpose is for those modifications, um, whether it is, um, you know, everything from allowing a child to have a fidget in the forensic interview room, which can serve in some sense as an assistive device for their anxiety to the potential of, you know, I've seen interviews where a child maybe doesn't communicate verbally, but they use, um, they're able to type or to write out responses, right? 
Um, again, I think that when we have these sorts of modifications that come up within our interview process, we want to have uh, be able to explain why we made those modifications, take that team ownership over things that we can do um, in order to limit the potential for contamination um, when we're utilizing those different modifications and make a choice that is, in, is as informed as possible for what this child needs in order to communicate about their experiences if there are experiences they need to communicate about. Um, and so again, in terms of will this be able to stand up in court, um, I think, again, getting as much advanced training, and you had uh, mentioned a couple of trainings here specifically, getting as much training and different perspectives as possible is really, really important. And really having those team discussions, taking ownership over what your choices are, why you made those choices, and what informed those decisions is gonna be really important um, for defending those modifications within the court process. Um, so as we had talked about again, um, we've already talked about some of our pre-interview preparation, understanding abilities and disabilities, understanding um, our different types of questions and how they could be utilized within our interview process. Um, as I said earlier, I kind of started planting the seeds a little bit for this conversation um, about polyvictimization, both in terms of talking about that child physical abuse and child sexual abuse facilitators article, um, but also talking holistically about how oftentimes in order to understand um, the how, when, and why, uh, the coping skills or coping mechanisms, the dynamics of one form of maltreatment, we do need to explore and understand in context how that form of maltreatment functions alongside other experiences, whether it is other forms of poly victimization or victimization, whether it's historical experiences with systems, whether it is family culture, whether it is environmental factors, right? We really want to understand in context these other experiences that a young person may have that could potentially shape their perspective of the abuse that um, they're currently experiencing, right? Because we know that this compounding of these different um, events um, or these different life experiences can really shape or shift um, the lens that the child sees these events through and also sees themselves and their disclosure. Um, I think about times, you know, we get the report, someone calls to schedule a forensic interview, and there's an articulated reason for the forensic interview. And after I go through my report and I ask the child, how come you're here today? Or what do you know about being here today? The child ends up disclosing something completely different, right? A lot of times when the system finds out about a particular life experience or an allegation of a particular life experience that the child has, sometimes that life experience is something that has been ongoing, has been repeated. And so the child, when they're thinking about what's most prescient for them or what they have worries or concerns about or what they wanna talk about, right? Um, a lot of times there are other things that come to mind first when they think about their identified reason for being there or what their worries or concerns are, right? Um, so I think about just a couple of, of case examples. Uh, I think about a child that was interviewed in a jurisdiction that I worked for, came in for sexual abuse on the part of the father at open invitation, how come you're here today? Child talks about a wine bottle being thrown at his mom's head. For him, um, again, the sexual abuse, he had that accommodation to that. It was ongoing and repeated, but this new thing that had just happened instilled in him at that time more fear, right? So we had to take the time to explore the domestic violence and through building the rapport by taking seriously this allegation of domestic violence and understanding how that affected him, which on the, um, you know, as a sub point, the disclosure of domestic violence was also a crime, right? And something that became known to the authorities. But through taking seriously these other reports or this other identified reason for being there, it built that rapport so he felt comfortable talking about the sexual abuse. So when we think about poly victimization, it's the experience of multiple victimizations of different types. So it's not just repeated victimization of one type, but again, ongoing um, victimization of, of more than one type. 
So we know, as I talked about, that 66% of children um, are exposed to more than one type of victimization, and we know this from the ACE study um, and also some other um, David Finkelhorst studies, Dr. Finkelhorst studies as well, too. Um, and oftentimes, this is something that is missed within our interview process. We get this hyper-focus on one particular allegation that we miss really, really critical um, pieces of the totality of the child's experiences or other ways harms um, danger that the child may be experiencing that could potentially warrant um, some sort of investigation or intervention. 64% 0.5% of youth who reported any direct victimization reported more than one type. 50% um, of sexually abused youth are poly victims. Um, and when you looked at children that were physically assaulted in the last year, five they were five times more likely to be neglected or maltreated um, and six times more likely to be sexually assaulted. So you see this very high co-occurrence. Um, we also see too that a lot of times poly victimization can be related to other sorts of victimizing experience that maybe don't necessarily fall under the umbrella of what we traditionally recognize as child abuse and maltreatment, um, but peer-to-peer -peer sexual assault, um, other types of sexual harassment, um, other witness or exposure to violence, sometimes gang violence, um, other forms of emotional abuse as well too. Uh, when we look at our subset of children that are made known to the child welfare system, we see even higher rates of poly victimization. So 90% of children ages 2 to 17 in this study that um, were identified as having experienced a form of abuse and maltreatment by the system, um, were targets of direct or indirect past year victimization, 93 were experienced more than one form of victimization, and 54% had experienced at least four forms of victimization. We know, and I talked about this a little bit too, but when we think about children with disabilities, they can be even at an increased risk of potentially experiencing abuse and maltreatment. And there's a lot of different factors um, that again is entirely its own um, training in addition to this, but lots of different risk factors that can contribute to that increased vulnerability um, on the part of this population. Um, I'm sure that many of you are already familiar with the ACE study. It's a pretty predominant piece of research, peer-reviewed research research within our field, a uh, very, very large sample size, but it really looks at the way that childhood um, experiences can impact um, stress and negative experiences later than life, right? So how those childhood experiences can determine what happens to us into adulthood. And so like I had said, holistically really assessing and looking at what all of those different experiences are is going to be critical for really understanding what a meaningful intervention might look like with this child. Um, and from an advocacy perspective, post-interview, really thinking about what are all those different supports um, that this child may need um, as they move forward. Uh, in their life, right? So it's both in terms of the criminal investigation and those components, but also thinking holistically about the child's needs. So I, um, I'm trained in a number of different forensic interview protocols, but um, primarily I, I teach the child first protocol and I use the child first protocol primarily um, for the majority of the forensic interviews that I conduct. Um, and within the Child First Forensic Interview Protocol, there is actually um, the inclusion concretely into the protocol process of the screening for other forms of maltreatment um, or seeing if there are these other, other life experiences that a child has. Um, just like we talked about in the first study that we discussed, we know that um, one of the biggest facilitators to whether or not a child ends up disclosing physical abuse is whether or not they were asked about physical abuse when they presented for another topic, right? And so we want to make sure that we do that. Just as a visual representation within the Child First Protocol, again, we start out with our open invitation. So how come you're here today? What do you know about being here today? Most protocols include something of that nature. Um, and then depending on whether it's a bodily allegation or non-bodily allegation, um, we'll either go to our anatomical diagrams, structure, um, naming the body parts on the diagrams with children 10 and under, and a conversation about okay or not okay touch. Um, or go to explore family relationships to dig in deeper into the dynamics of um, the, the family and the lived realities of the child. 
However, in every interview, um, we will make sure that we go and do both of these explorations, right? So if open invitation fails in its bodily allegation, we'll start with our anatomical diagrams and touch inquiry structure, but we're still gonna ask about family experiences, right? And if it's a non-bodily allegation, we're gonna start out by asking about those family experiences, but still screen for um, the potential of, of sexual abuse or physical abuse or other sorts of bodily allegations. So we really want to consider uh, what the inclusion of this looks like within our interview process. So here's just some examples um, within your notes of some of the ways you may broach this topic or this screening for other forms of maltreatment uh, within your interview process. Again, different protocols have different ways of approaching this and may have a different sort of um, trajectory with regards to where you may or may not introduce any of these questions. Again, you'll notice thinking about our hourglass that a lot of these are either open-ended questions that will yield a narrative response or their screening questions that are a bit more direct that then we're going to want to open up um, afterwards, right? So a question like, do people fight in your house? Very direct question. Um, so you'll see, tell me about that is listed afterwards. Um, so if a child says, yeah, people fight in my house, tell me all about people fighting in your house. We want to make sure that then we're opening it back up for that full narrative response. Um, sometimes too, some of these topics can seem a little bit innocuous, but um, they can be helpful to explore, right? So asking about who cooks for them can sometimes yield food insecurity. It also sometimes, um, in the case of one of my colleagues, can also yield information about um, maybe cooking things that shouldn't be cooked in the home, such as meth um, in one of the cases that she conducted an interview for. The child disclosed, mommy does the good cooking and daddy does the bad cooking. And when she explored daddy doing the bad cooking, again, um, the a meth lab. Uh, being in the household was revealed, right? Um, asking about who takes care of them um, can sometimes yield supervision issues or a lack of care for the child, or like I said, food insecurity, rules about bathrooms, um, rules within the house, things of that, of that nature. Um, I one time had a disclosure of uh, pretty intensive psychological maltreatment because I asked about rules about the bathroom and the children talked about how they were pretty much under constant surveillance on the part of um, the parents or caregivers. And so they would even have to text the parents if they need to go to the bathroom. And one of the things that the children disclosed is that he often, he was diabetic and often had accidents in his room because he was scared to leave his room without permission from his parents. And sometimes they didn't text him back in time to let him know that it was okay for him to use the bathroom. So it really revealed um, this highly integrated complex system of psychological maltreatment with these particular children. Other examples, again, of sample questions here for screening for potential exposure to pornography or the use of pornography within a grooming manipulation or desensitization process, um, asking about physical abuse, um, domestic violence, emotional maltreatment. Um, with the neglect or risk of harm, I think sometimes we can also phrase this too as, do people ever take medicines in your house? Tell me about that. Or do people ever drink things that make them act differently? So a few different ways to ask about that depending on the child's developmental level. Um, again, this is really, uh, these are just some quotes. I talked to you a little bit about the APSAC FI practice guidelines um, a little bit earlier, um, but there really is uh, the importance again of trying to get as much detailed information about the allegation of abuse as possible. And I talked about this quite a bit already when we discussed quality and quantity of detail of really walking into your interview and reminding yourself that we do not know yet necessarily what is gonna be relevant or irrelevant. So really making sure that we are asking for, as we talked about, um, that full story, story or that full um, narrative response about what, what is happening. So sometimes details like, um, again, objects that were involved about where things are kept, um, about, again, inducements or bribes, those types of things can be really, really helpful. Um, even thinking too about in technology facilitated crimes, about devices, things of that nature, gathering all of those contextual details is really, really important within our forensic interview process. Um, asking about other no others' knowledge of the abuse. Did someone see this happen with your eyes? Tell me about that. Who have you talked to about this? Has someone told you anything about this? Um, 
you know, have you told or talked to someone about this? How come you couldn't talk about it before? What made it okay to talk about it now? Has someone asked you or told you to keep a secret about something? Tell me about that. So really getting to um, other people's knowledge of the abuse and other also potential for contamination. Dells and diagrams, I'm not gonna get into this too deeply because different protocols um, have different approaches for using dolls and diagrams. Um, but again, using a purposeful approach within the context of your protocol for this, both to, again, assist with clarity, communication, distancing, um, potentially depending on the dynamics within the interview process, um, but also as, again, an ulterior um, alternative, excuse me, way for that child to be able to communicate about their experiences if there's an articulated purpose for doing so. So, for instance, in the case of anatomical dolls, we would only want to ever use dolls as a demonstration aid post-disclosure and never as a discovery tool. Asking developmentally appropriate questions, clarifying pronouns, um, just one last resource here too. Um, Anne Grafham Walker is a excellent researcher within our field um, and she did a lot of work on the linguistic features of children and so she has a book called The Handbook for Questioning Children. Oh, I actually have it right here. I'll just show you what it looks like here. Um, but I highly recommend that if you are a forensic interviewer or if you're a prosecutor questioning children on the stand, um, it can be a really, really helpful resource. Um, again, making sure that we are thinking within the context of our protocol of where we want to include poly victimization screening. And again, if you want any additional, um, have any additional questions about this or want technical assistance around this too, this is certainly something you can reach out to us for. So with that, I'm gonna open it up um, for any additional questions and I'm gonna check the chat again to, before I pass it over to William for some closing comments here shortly. Um, but again, here's some more information on how you can get in contact with us at Zero Abuse Project. I definitely invite you if there's anything that we can do to help or support you in your work, um, both on the prosecution side, as well as the investigative side, as well as the forensic interviewing side, we would love to do that. Um, and again, once again, oops, excuse me, here is my email. So I'm gonna look through the chat for questions that I may have missed, and then I will um, open it up for any additional questions that you may have. Rachel and while you're looking through the chat to see if there's any uh, questions that you'd like to address just there a quick is a reminder. question um, from one of our colleagues that came in about some specifics around um, documents and cases I am a forensic interviewer so I'm fully going to stay in my lane um, around this question um, but if you'd like to send me an email I'm happy to connect you with our staff attorneys so they can um, uh, assist you with that specific question uh, and the legality of of um, working with documents. A question came in, why do you think most CPA cases are disclosed uh, first in adulthood? Um, again, this kind of goes back to what I was discussing a bit earlier with regard to how we have, again, myths, stereotypes, perceptions that protect abuse or maintain the secrecy um, and the dynamics of sexual abuse. And we have similar um, sorts of beliefs or self-internalization um, with regard to physical abuse as well. So I think a lot of uh, adult survivors of child physical abuse either felt like they were to blame, they did something to deserve it, or have difficulty disambiguating um, maybe what what is reasonable discipline of a child or what is under the law acceptable discipline as a child of a child versus what is a form of physical abuse. Um, other questions. What advice would you give someone that is going to school to become a prosecutor? How do we land a job? Um, if you want to email me, I will connect you uh, with prosecutors uh, to answer that question for you. As a forensic interviewer, I don't feel uh, comfortable telling you about how to achieve um, your goal of becoming a prosecutor because that's slightly different from my career path. But if you want to send me an email, I will connect you with the right folks to, to answer that question. 
Yes, thank you so much everyone for being here. I'm gonna pass it over to William here in just a moment, but I do on behalf of myself and on behalf of Zero Abuse Project, want to thank you all so much uh, for the work that you do out in the field. Children and families are safer, communities are safer because they have you advocating um, for them, right? And so thank you, thank you so much for the work that you do. I'm really proud to work alongside of you all um, in our effort to end child abuse. So with that, William, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Thank you for your time today. Great, thank you, Rachel. Mic check, just wanna make sure you can hear me okay? Thumbs up. Okay. Hmm. So it looks like my audio may be out. I just want to confirm. You. Are you able to hear me? Okay. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, so thank you everyone for those who joined us just really quickly before we um, adjourn for today. Please note that the there's a poll question that's currently going on over in the um, control panel. If you click on the option that says polling, please be sure to go there and complete the poll question prior to you uh, leaving for today's webinar. Uh, just take a moment just to do that poll really quickly and we appreciate your feedback. Uh, just a quick uh, reminder to folks as well that you will receive your certificate within 24 hours, so be sure to be on the lookout for that in your email. Also, if you'd like to get in contact with Intech, here's the contact information where you can reach us, and we'll be more than happy to uh, help assist you with any questions that you may have. Uh, we also encourage you to please go to OJJDP's website and be sure to uh, go and sign up for their listserv, which is called Juve Just, where you'll be able to learn more about events that we have uh, and web events like this that we'll be hosting with OJJDP's Intact. Um, we also encourage you guys uh, to go to the uh, OJJDP multimedia and YouTube page as well um, that we mentioned at the top of the hour. So please take a, note, a moment to go there and actually uh, check out those videos. And if you need any of the supporting materials related to that, please be sure to come uh, to the help desk and we'll be more than happy to help you with that. And then finally, uh, don't forget to join us for these events that we have here. Uh, Note that these events are the upcoming zero abuse webinars that we have for the month of November. Please note that the event on the 2nd is only for law enforcement personnel. So please note that we are only asking for individuals who are law enforcement personnel to sign up and register for that event on November the 2nd. Those links are live and ready for you to register as well. Uh, just a reminder to everyone um, about the other events here, and let's see, and we also encourage you to please connect to OJJDPs um, uh, through their various multimedia sites that they have here as well. Again, thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon and take care.